Hey everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are continuing our second unit on cell structure and function by getting into topic 2.6, which is on membrane transport. In topic 2.5, we talked about membrane permeability. What kinds of molecules can pass through the phospholipid bilayer? And in 2.4, we discussed what that phospholipid bilayer is. Well, it's got a polar head and a two fatty acid nonpolar tails for each one of those phospholipids that are kind of face each other in a bilayer like that. Um, so we talked about the structure of the plasma membrane, and we also spoke about what is able to pass through it. Today we're going to be able to talk about how things pass through it and the process by which the cell membrane is able to regulate what comes in and what goes out of cells and how it's able to establish something called a concentration gradient. Um, but before we get into that, we have to talk about the one of the main, I should say, one of the main properties of fluids. And by fluids, I mean liquids and gases. And that's diffusion. Diffusion, as I put up here, is essential for a cell to bring in nutrients and take out, I should say, out waste. Um, so how diffusion works, it's, well, I'm going to get there in a second. Let's walk through an example of how diffusion is. So let's pretend here, I know it's a very complex diagram, that we have a high concentration of molecules over on one side of this dotted line, which we're going to pretend is a selectively permeable barrier. Um, and on the other side, we have a low concentration of this molecules. Now concentration, you're going to hear me say that word again and again and again and again, and I need you to know what that means. A concentration simply refers to the number of molecules in a given amount of space or a given amount of volume. Okay. <coughs> So on this side of the uh, on this side of the barrier, there's a lot of molecules relative to the other side. Um, in this, if they have the same amount of volume, this one's going to have a higher concentration because there's more molecules that fill up that volume. Okay, so we have a high concentration on one side and a low concentration on the other side. Um, what diffusion is? It's the tendency for molecules to spread out that go from areas of high concentration to a low concentration. So as an example of diffusion that I always like to bring up is say you got a glass of water and you have a thing of food coloring. You drop food coloring into the glass of water, what's going to happen? The food coloring will eventually spread out throughout the entire glass of water. It's not going to stay as one tiny droplet the whole time. That's diffusion, the tendency for fluids like that to spread out and fill up available space. All right, so cells are really, really dependent on this property of diffusion that fluids like gases and liquids, so molecules tend to spread out from one another. So if we have a high concentration of molecules on one side of this barrier and a low concentration on the other side of this barrier, well, these molecules that are all packed together like sardines over here, they're going to spread out. They're going to spread out and the concentrations on either side of this barrier will eventually become equal. And that's a state that we call equilibrium. In fact, I'm going to highlight that down here so you know that it's an important term. Equilibrium refers to when there's a hot or there's a equal concentration on either side of a membrane or a barrier of some kind. All right, so it's in equilibrium. So in order to define diffusion, I kind of referred to it earlier, but it's the movements of particles so that they tend to spread out in available space. So we can say that the food coloring diffuses in that glass of water. We know that air diffuses or gases diffuse because air fills up a container or whatever container it's in, right? So it is diffused. It is spread out. There's not more air concentrated in one spot versus you know, another spot in a room. It's all very evenly spread out. Okay, so that's diffusion. Cells are dependent on this property of diffusion. And diffusion happens when there is a concentration gradient. And a concentration gradient, as I put up here, um, it's a region along which the density of a substance increases or decreases. So density is referring to concentration here again. Um, so check it out. This is a concentration gradient. What we had before, where we had more molecules on one side than we did on the other, there's a higher concentration on one side and a lower concentration on the other. That is what we call a concentration gradient. Um, something you might have you might have heard the word gradient before, like when it comes to I don't know colors. There's a gradient of colors ranging from red to purple, right? Um, 
that's kind of it's kind of similar. Um, another another word that you might hear gradient or grade is when you're going up or down a hill. Okay, so imagine this: In the area with the high concentration, you know, molecules are going to move to the area of low concentration until they're equal, right? Think of this as like maybe the top of a hill. Okay, at the top of a hill, you got a high concentration or high um, elevation, and what things tend to do, they tend to move to a low elevation. Um, so they kind of go downhill, and you can kind of think of a concentration gradient in the same way, that we have a high to low down here. So what I like to call this is that substance diffuse down the concentration gradient. Molecules are naturally just going to move to where they want to go, from high to low concentration. Um, just like things at the top of a hill, you know, if they're given the right push, they're going to tend to go down um, and down the gradient. All right, so when we're talking about diffusion with respect to the cell membrane, we're talking about passive transport. And passive means that, like, yeah, we're not expending a whole lot of energy. It just kind of happens naturally. So we call it passive transport This is because the cell does not need to use energy to move substances across. So to illustrate this again, we got our fancy phospholipid bilayer here, right? Uh, we've got a uh, higher concentration of oxygen, these blue dots on one side, and we've got a higher concentration of carbon dioxide on the other side. So let's just say this is the inside of the cell and this is the outside of the cell. Now, if I'm a cell, I really want to get rid of my carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is a waste product, and I really, really want to bring in oxygen so that you know I can do my metabolism and make my ATP. So what I want on this side needs to come in, and what I want on this side needs to go out. Now, how does a cell do that? Well, a cell can rely a little bit upon diffusion in order for that to happen. All right, so if you look closely here, there's a high concentration of blue, high concentration of red, and then there's an even concentration of blue and red on either side. This is representing what we call equilibrium. There's no more concentration gradient. There's two concentration gradients here. Red's going to move out and blue's going to move in. Okay, but if we just let passive transported diffusion do its thing, there's going to be an even number of molecules on either side of the membrane. All right, so that's, that's cool. You know, we brought some of that carbon dioxide out. We brought some of the oxygen in. That, that, that's great. That's great. You know, but uh, as a cell, you need more oxygen and you need to get rid of your carbon dioxide. So how exactly do you do that? A cell is able to do something called active transport, and it has to use some of its energy in the form of the molecule ATP to move solutes against, that should say against, the concentration gradient. All right, so check it out. We're at equilibrium right now. We got an equal amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide on either side of this membrane, but we want to bring more oxygen in, and we want to take more carbon dioxide out. So what are we going to do? Well, a cell can use some of its ATP and use some of those proteins that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer in order to get this done, okay? It's not going to be easy to move things against the concentration gradient, but the cell's got to do it. It's got to use some energy. A metaphor I like to use, like if we go back to calling a concentration gradient like a hill, right? If you're going from high concentration to low concentration and you're on your bike or something, you can just coast down the hill, right? It's not gonna, it's kind of passive. You don't need to expend that much energy. But if you wanna go from low elevation to high elevation, yeah, then you gotta use some energy, right? It's the same kind of idea here. Another metaphor is like, if you're paddling down river with the stream, right? You can just kinda let the stream take you um, down the river. But if you wanna go up river, you gotta expend some energy, okay? It's the same concept here. All right, even if we're at equilibrium, if we got to move things against the concentration gradient or against, you know, diffusion, then that means that, you know, we got to expend some energy. So what a cell might do, and I just want to make a note here that carbon dioxide and uh, oxygen are shipped out in, of the cell membrane, shipped in and out of the cell membrane via facilitated diffusion, which is our next uh, topic, one of our topics coming up. Um, but we're just going to pretend it's active transport for the sake of this video. All right, so disclaimer there. Um, so if my cell wants, it can use some ATP to power up this protein over here and take more stuff in and move more stuff out. That's called active transport. It has to use a little bit of energy in order to reestablish a concentration gradient. So check it out. We had mostly blue on this side to begin with and mostly red on that side to begin with. Now it's kind of flip-flopped. We brought more oxygen in and more carbon dioxide out, thanks to active transport. 
And here's a really important thing to note. In fact, I am going to underline it. Ready? Underlined. It's important. Active transport and selective permeability allow a cell to make concentration gradients. Okay, so a cell can manipulate using active transport and using its membrane proteins. It can manipulate what concentrations are on either side of the membrane. So it can control what's going in and what's going out. That's where the selective permeability of the cell membrane comes in. Um, for example, your neurons, so the, the cells that make up your nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord, all that stuff, they need to have a particular concentration of sodium on one side and potassium on the other side in order for it to be at what's called resting potential um, so that it can actually send signals from one cell to the other and so that your body can function as a whole and you can, your brain can work. Okay? So without being able to uh, establish these concentration gradients, your nerve cells would not work. And many cells need to be able to control their concentration gradients and manipulate them in such a way that they can control what comes in and what comes out. All right, so that's active transport. All right, but another type of active transport that we got to talk about has to do with a really big molecule. Okay, so this is my very detailed protein over here. A protein can't just pass through the bilayer and it can't just go through, you know, another protein like that. It's really big. Um, so what does the cell do for that? It's a... One second, it's a form of active transport that we're going to talk about. They're called exocytosis and endocytosis. Now, you, we may have uh, been exposed to this term before, but I'm going to highlight it here again. Um, membranes in and out of the cell can form vesicles, which are sacs made of membrane um, so that it can import and export large molecules. So remember how the consistency of the cell membrane, it's like a bubble. It's like a soap bubble, right? And a bubble can change shape. Bubbles can form smaller bubbles within them right? That's the same idea with the cell membrane. So um, the plasma membrane, as I put down here, works with the what we call the endomembrane system. And we might have talked about this in an earlier uh, topic, but the endomembrane system is like the membranes on the inside of the cell, right? So the ER, it synthesizes proteins. The smooth ER synthesizes lipids and hormones and that kind of stuff. Um, but how does it ship it out of the cell? Well, it's able to, you know, take a little bit of its membrane and pinch it off and form a little bubble. Okay, so if whatever the uh, cell membrane, or excuse me, the uh, ER, or maybe the Golgi apparatus made, um, it's going to be pinched off in this little bubble. And a bubble, it's like a, it's a vesicle, and it's made of membrane. And it's, it's a little membrane bubble that's going to travel out to the plasma membrane, to the outside, and it can fuse with the rest of the plasma membrane and thus release those particles that are, you know, the, the products that the cell made. It can release it and send it to other cells if need be. Um, and endocytosis, let's just say this is like some kind of food molecule. It's a big, big food molecule. Um, the plasma membrane can kind of form a bubble around it and then import it into the cell. And that's called endocytosis. Okay, so it's able to form a vesicle just by, you know, changing the shape of that cell membrane. It's pretty sweet. So as I stated before, exocytosis is when the cell secretes molecules by the fusion of vesicles with the plasma membrane to release it to the outside. Okay, so the ER, the Golgi, forms a vesicle, sends it out. Um, and endocytosis is when the cell secretes molecules um, by the fusion. That's not right. Um, the cell takes in molecules by the fusion of vesicles with the plasma membrane. Glad we fixed that. Um, so it's able to, the cell membrane is able to pinch off and form a little bubble. Um, that's called a vesicle, and it's able to transport that around the cell. Pretty sweet. Um, two more types of endocytosis that I want to talk about. Um, phagocytosis is what we call the endocytosis of these solid food particles. So if we were to be specific about what kind of endocytosis this is, that's called phagocytosis. Um, and another type of endocytosis is called pinocytosis, which is endocytosis of extracellular fluids. So this is kind of like the cells eating and this is the cells drinking. All right, um, that'll be it for 2.6. This is an important topic and it's going to lead, you know, into the rest of the unit for sure. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you next time. Bye.